Welcome back to MVP Real Estate Podcast, Season 4, Episode 4, with Joel Friedland of Brit Properties uh, in our backyard almost, well, proximity. He's in Chicago. Uh, we're in southeastern Wisconsin. Um, over four decades of experience, broker, owner, uh, a lot of his stuff, well, all of his stuff is syndication which is interesting for me. We've never really done anything syndication wise. Um, and he is in the industrial market. So another commercial side of things. Um, super nice guy. And he talks about the importance of listening um, and how that affects his, I mean, his career has been built on on listening. And he talks about the one little, uh, I don't know if you can call it like a wake up call or, what did he categorize that as? It was early on in his career uh, with an investor. Um, but I guess we'll bring him on the show. We can talk about it. Well, thanks for being here, Joel. Um, uh, I want to get into a couple topics with you. I know you are heavy in industrial uh, real estate. Uh, many decades of of uh, history that you can bestow upon us. You've already kind of done that before we started recording. So thank you for all the help already. Um, but before we get into those things, can you just give us and the listeners a little like 30 second background of where you came from, uh, in kind of some key moments in your life that led you to where you are today. And then we'll kind of get into everything. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so my family is, uh, like you guys from Wisconsin and we, they landed in Chicago and I grew up in Highland park, uh, Northern suburb. And went to the University of Michigan. And I knew from the time I was very young, way before college, I wanted to be in real estate. I just knew it. I knew people in real estate and it looked like kind of a cool thing to do. So I graduated from Michigan uh, during a big recession 40 something years ago. I'm 64. At 22, interest rates were uh, in 1981, 17%. And I got hired Ooh. to be a leasing agent by a family that owned 80 industrial buildings. It was a father, two sons, and a daughter. And I went to work for them and they said, hey, we've got all these vacancies. Why don't you fill them? So I went canvassing door to door to industrial parks and talked to owners of companies and said, hey, I've got a vacant building a few doors away. You want to move? And I did that like hundreds of times a week. And I filled up nine of 10 vacancies and learned nice. the business. And I was a real estate broker, but broker, like people do homes, there are brokers who do nothing but industrial. And so I became an industrial real estate broker, helping tenants and sellers and buyers. And I did it for a long time. And I realized the only way to get wealthy in real estate is to own it. Brokering is great. It's a good way to make a living, as you know. When you're an agent uh, and you're leasing, you can make a really good living. Yep. But you have to start over every day. Every every January 1st, it's a new year and you got to start the new year and you're starting from scratch. And I saw that if I could buy properties and own them, owning is forever and collecting rent is monthly. So I went to the family that I worked for they were syndicators. They had done dozens of syndications. And I said, I want to be a syndicator. Will you help me do it? And they said, yes, <laughs> we'll help you do it. They said, we'll put up a third of the money for your first deal. We'll introduce you to our investors, but you've got to find the deal and you've got to find your own investors and put your own money in. So my first deal was at, uh, an industrial building in Gurney, which okay. is uh about 20 minutes from the Wisconsin border up north in the far north suburbs of Chicago. And I built a building from scratch, uh, 14,000 square feet. And I raised money from a bunch of people, $20,000 each, including myself. I did something called a private placement memorandum. There's a lot of securities laws. And when you raise money from people, it's highly regulated. So this is this thing right here is called a private placement memorandum. And I put one of these together for uh, the deal in Gurney. I got a lawyer who specialized in securities. And I went out 
and I met with all these investors and they said, yeah, we'll take a chance on you, kid. So we raised the money, built the building, leased the building and collected rent. And it felt really good. So I went and did another one. And that one was bigger. It was two and a half million dollars, raising money in chunks of 75,000 each. And then after that, I've done um, another 98 acquisitions of industrial buildings. Chicago, Florida, Ohio, New York. And um, I raise money from people uh, when I have a building that makes sense for them, that they like the look of, they like the feel of, they like the return. Most, of, most importantly, they have to trust the syndicator, the sponsor. So I have to convince them that I'm worthy of their trust in order for them to give me their money. They don't just wire money without knowing somebody. It's all about yeah. relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how old were you on your first deal? 29. Nice. Man, that is going from zero to a hundred quickly. Cause that is, <laughs> that's a lot for a 29 year old to raise capital on for a ground up project. So kudos on that one. I'm I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and try to understand the nerves that were going on in the the nervousness as we're in the building process. I was too stupid to be nervous. Sometimes that's needed though. <laughs> I think yeah. there's there's been so many people that talk about like you need to be a little bit stubborn and a little bit naive to yes. get things done. Yeah, I thought I could do it, so I did it. I didn't know that I couldn't do it. Yeah, but, and that's, like that, that. that's something that I see. You, I, I'm going to relate, relate it to sports, but like you see people breaking like records for like either the 100 yard or 100 meter or the the one mile like time. But if there's nobody ever there to put the negative thought in your head, like this can't be done, you don't know that you can't push beyond that barrier that is just mentally created by others, right? Like you push through it, not even knowing that there's an obstacle or a hurdle in front of you. And you break that record and people are like, well, how did you do this? You're like, you just went out and did it. Nobody told me I couldn't do it. Right. Like there's the, the night, the, what do you call it? Naivete of people. Like, yeah, that's. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, 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 but there is a, a thing about it that has to be in place, which is you've got to have the talent and the perseverance to do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. People, if you never give up, you're going to get something done. If yeah. you have the talent, you know, someone can't run the fastest mile. No one's going to run a three minute and something mile unless they are wildly talented and incredibly uh, in good shape. Right. Yeah. I, it's, it's just not going to happen unless all the stars align. But if you have a dream, I think it comes down to having a vision first. I had a vision in my mind of what I wanted to do and, and all the pieces were, were there. And I could, if I had a big whiteboard, you know, I could write all the pieces down and the vision is whole. It's find the land, find the builder, find the investors, figure out the materials you're going to build it out of, figure out how you're going to find tenants. It, it all has to be there, which means in order to, to do a syndication properly, a lot of experience is needed. Nobody just starts with no experience in real estate and goes and does a syndication. First, you have to know something. Yeah. And you have to have had some level um, of difficulties along the way because people relate, investors relate to honesty. And so when I go syndicate, I don't tell people how great I am. I tell people I have a lot of experience and I've learned a lot and learning a lot means I made some mistakes and had some rough times and had to figure out how to get through them. People trust someone who's had a rough time and has worked through it. Yeah. It's funny that you say that because uh, my son's jujitsu instructor says there is no losing. There's winning and learning. So you're either on the winning team or you're on the learning team. Uh, I guess the only loss is if you don't take anything from it. So you yeah. go through those those failed projects or projects that don't um, pan yeah. out the way that you wanted to. Just don't make the same mistake. Learn from it and, and get better. You reminded you know, me of Wolf of Wall Street when you said, don't judge me by my wins. Judge me by my losses because I have so few. 
Oh uh, no, I don't say that. <laughs> no, I, I just said it. That's what it reminded yeah. me of. But it, it's yeah. like you said, you don't you don't have losses. You have learning opportunities or ways to improve the whatever. Well, process yeah, I, I I actually talk about my losses. Um, yeah. I had a a very interesting experience. Um, uh, I went to see a very wealthy guy to invest and I sat with his family in their, in their kitchen, trying to convince him to put money into a deal. And, um, he said, so tell me about your track record. I said, we've never lost any money. This was a number of years ago. He said, oh, well then I'm not investing with you. I really? Said, what? He said, yeah. It's unrealistic that you've never lost money. Maybe you haven't really lost money because you've never been through a rough patch, or maybe it's because you have bad deals and you just aren't admitting it and you're hiding them from people. He said, but come on. Cause I told him that I had bought 70 buildings already. He said, and you have no, no, no bad deals. I said, well, we haven't lost money. He said, you will. He said, I'm out. I'm not investing. Not with you. Interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see the the battle scars and the perseverance of of how you work through it. Yeah. Interesting. And Have probably, you probably the amount of money you're asking for wasn't even significant for him to even like scoff at. He he could have just given you the he could have just given you the money and let you go have success with it. But he, I mean. Yeah. On principle, he's like, yeah, let's see what you can learn. Or yeah, it's it's a do. yes or no situation. Right. Yeah. And I was a no for him. There was there was nothing I could have done um, to convince him after that. I, I could have said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I could have maybe come up with a brilliant answer. I didn't have one. On to the next one. Yeah. Oh, it's like um, Pursuit of Happiness when Will Smith comes in. And he's like, yeah. what would you say if I gave a job to a guy with no shirt? That's your, he's got to have really nice pants comment that you could have came back yeah, with. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I've learned one time. thing about investors and how you uh, build a relationship with them. And that is to listen. You know, there's so many, there's so many stories and so many slogans about listening. One of my favorite ones is uh, take the, cotton out of your ears ears and put the cotton in your mouth yeah which you know instead of telling him how great we were and we hadn't lost money i should have been asking him questions yeah and then they and, and that's another there's another um statement that i really like another slogan um there's a, there was a guy named dale carnegie who was yeah he wrote books about positive mental attitude and making good decisions and he said, um, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I like that one. What book was that in? Can you how recall? How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay, because okay. that's the one. I, I've read that one for sure. Um, I want to say that I've read two of his books. Super good mentality on, on people um, in self-reflection. But, I mean... For you and your career, I think that speaks very, very true. With you starting out as a leasing agent, you need to, number one, listen to what they need. Like, can the facility that I'm selling even suit what they want? So right. your first thing is to listen. So in within networking, which is pretty much everything you've been doing within your career is networking and listening to, to either investors or um, companies that are going to lease buildings from you. So that's it's it's very interesting that you bring that point up because from the second you got on here, you you are a very good listener. Like you ask questions and you'll sit and you'll listen to our answers of whatever we've got going on. So um you're yeah, staying. You wanna, you wanna hear my favorite my favorite slogan is really kind of a tool. It's a four-letter tool. Uh W A I T. Every time you're talking to someone, think W A I T, which it means wait, but it stands for why am I talking? Hmm. <laughs> I catch myself in those situations sometimes. And I think of what, the only one that sticks out to me, and I think we learned this from Snap or maybe earlier, is that you have two ears in one mouth, use them proportionately. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's so, funny. My 
I use that W A I T especially when I'm dealing with my my wife. Like, <laughs> don't don't say what you're about to say. I was I I really opened my I was just in Florida visiting my mother and I was there for um, a, f a few days of uh, gorgeous weather and we went to pick up some of her friends for dinner at a complex uh, where there was a gate um, and a guard shack. And the young guy at the guard shack, he must have been brand new. And it took like five minutes to get to him because everybody was, their car was like stuck where he was talking to them through the window of the guard shack. And I'm thinking, why is this taking so long? What? How long does it take to get in? And I finally got up there and I said to him, I'm here to visit uh the Cirque family. And he said, what building are they in? And my mother and I were sitting together. We said, we don't know what, what building they're in. He says, well, I can't let you in unless you tell me what building they're in. So my mom grabs her phone and starts dialing her friend to figure out what building they're in. Like, they, buildings all have numbers, G7, G4, G3. We didn't know. So I said to the kid, um, he must have been in his early 20s. I said, look, I don't, we'll get through to this person, but there, if you look behind me, there's like six people in line waiting to get in. How about if you open the gate, I'll pull my car up behind the guard shack and I'll wait and then I'll come back to you and I'll tell you what, what they're in. He said, no, that's against the rules. I can't let you in. I said, well, do you ever go like to a fast food restaurant where you're at the uh, window ordering in the drive-thru and your food's not ready? So they say, hey, just pull up there and we'll bring you your food. And he said, uh, no. I said, come, I said, come on. You ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David? Yeah. You know that show? I, I, you know, he's a he's a character in that that nobody really wants to be, but he's funny because nobody would want to be that way because they'd be hated and despised. And so I, I said to my mother, I said, this kid's an idiot. And my mother said, be patient. He looks like he's new. I said, hey, kid, there's six cars behind me, and it's going to take us a couple minutes to get through to the person and get the building number. He said, you can't get in until you give me the building number. I said, just let me move in, open the gate. I'll put my car there. I'm not going to drive around and smash into somebody's house in your complex. He said, I can't do it. I said, you're an idiot. Uh, my mother looked at me and she said, what is wrong with you? I said, the kid's an idiot. And it was such a mistake. I should have remembered. W-A-I-T. He was just doing his job. He was an idiot, but he was just doing his <laughs> job. So, you know, yeah. and, and so when you're, when I'm dealing with tenants, investors, contractors, I try to be as friendly and nice as I can, no matter what happens. I try not to get flustered and I try to listen. And uh, that was one of those experiences where I didn't do a very good job. Yeah, we all have those, though, because I, I try to do the same. I try to be patient. I try to listen. There are some times that catch you at a bad time in a wrong conversation. It, yesterday, I had one of those as well. I'm at the gas station. I'm pulling a trailer behind me. So mind, I'm a, a larger vehicle here. I stop off at the gas station because I got into the gas station with zero miles left to, to my tank being empty. So I pull into the spot and I'm on the phone. So I don't want to turn off my truck because my car speaker is carrying the phone. And I see the gas station attendant come out and he's like, are you getting gas? And I was like, yeah, I'm on the phone. Give me a couple minutes. And he's like, okay, went back in, came back out. I was on the phone for 20 minutes. Is that etiquette? No. So when he came back out the second time, he's like, hey, you got to move. And I was like, I have zero miles. If I move my truck, I might have to like push it 10 feet to the thing. And I've been here for 20 minutes, sir. Not a single car has come to your gas station. So if you didn't have eight other open gas things, I'd understand. <laughs> I'm taking up two of them, but you've had no customers, but I'll move. I'll move. Again, you're an idiot, but I'll move. I get it. Uh, 
and normally I would have been able to like talk to him, but the conversation I was in was pressing. I lost my cool a little bit through a little bit too much. Uh, disrespect. Yeah. Yeah. I had, had a rough day. I, 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 it was, it was, I have employees, you know, I've got a property management company and accounting department. People who work for me. And earlier in the day, I had had an argument, which I never do with my uh, controller who's who does all the numbers he he gave me some stuff that was just incomplete and I, I I just was so upset with him and he started arguing with me when I said hey this is incomplete he started telling me that I can't talk to him that way and all that kind of stuff and I said wait just wait just wait and I wanted to just unload on him because I was right and he was wrong <laughs> and I'm the <laughs> boss but you know <laughs> uh I used weight but the kid just it was just one thing too many that day yeah um and then I mean on the flip side of that too and not I just like to plead devil's advocate or objective all the time but like on the flip side of that back to Marcus's with the gas attendant did he need to come out twice, let alone once, especially if it's not busy? My response to Marcus, maybe in that situation, the failure to plan on your part is not an oh, emergency yeah. for him, right? So like, yes. you, it, it, it's just a combination of the the both yep. parties. And then with you and your, your controller, it's like, well, what led him to that? Maybe he's got some personal going on or like something other pressing. I, I, obviously, I don't know what his job duties are and everything like yeah. that. But there's there's compounding effect with that like you know like what led to his if, if he doesn't normally do that and it's a one-off like hey this isn't normal for you and I, I expect certain excellence or certain quality of work from you and when you when it's off there's got to be something wrong like how do we yeah when you that? don't know somebody and you're talking to them you don't know what pain they're in you yeah. don't know what's happening in their life and yeah Sometimes it's just good to give them the benefit of the doubt because they may be struggling through something and I don't want to make it worse for them. You right. know, kindness is really important to me. Yeah. And when I'm unkind, I feel bad about it. And I know that's it's the wrong thing to do. I agree. Every time, every single, yeah. mm -hmm. even, yeah. even when someone's aggravating me, you know, the old adage, kill them with kindness. Right. Oh, and that just sets them off further sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what yeah, else do you was... want to know about syndication and industrial real estate? Yeah, let's get there. Um, what was I going to get into? Oh, before we get into that, have you ever read Don't Split the Difference? I've not read it, but I've talked to many people who have recommended it. Yeah, it's a very, very good. Uh, I think you'd enjoy it with your acronym of weight. Um, he always talks about uh, basically embrace the silence. So ask a question or say something, they may respond, but don't respond right away. Just wait. Yeah. And they'll they'll divulge more information or say what they really wanted to say once there's that little bit of silence in there. Yeah. Start, people start to get a little uneasy and they start to, they'll open up a little bit. But um, yeah. if you haven't, I would recommend reading that. It was a good one. I will. I'm going to read it. Thank you for that recommendation. I've I've heard that before from a few people. Yes. Um, and with what you're doing, a lot of your work is negotiation, whether you're working with people in the leases early on in your career, or you're negotiating with investors in with these industrial buildings. Yeah. So negotiation being a, a big, big thing. Um, strictly for industrial buildings, we uh, just had a podcast before the guys in commercial as well. They've been kind of taking a hit since COVID with everything pulling to go into more remote work. Industrial is, I think, probably, and I don't know anything about commercial, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, one of, I would think, the strongest commercial spaces with self-storage and um, I'm thinking about like Amazon, like retail yeah, yeah. storefronts are going down. Is that what you're seeing? Is that? Yeah, yeah. So self-storage is, is an asset class in and of itself. It's not industrial, but it is an asset class and it's a good one. I know a lot of people who've done very well and are continuing to really enjoy that business. It's doing great. 
what's struggling are offices and retail. Yeah. Industrial is the opposite. Industrial has never been higher in value. Rents have never been higher and occupancies have never been uh, any better than, than they are now. And the reason for that is the internet. It's because look what we're doing. We're on this, on this Zoom call for the podcast. We can sit on a call like this with somebody and look at them. If you told me when I first started in the business, when I was a fresh new agent, that one day people wouldn't be going to their office because they were going to work from home and they could turn on a computer and have yeah. a screen and see the other people and have a conversation, I would say, what? That can't happen. So offices are struggling because people don't have to go to work. Look, I'm sitting at my home office. I have an office. I just don't go there very often. Some people do. They want to get away from their husband or their wife. Right. <laughs> right? But <laughs> that's funny. Not go there. But yeah. uh, office is struggling. And, and many um, investors, which are mainly uh, large investors, are losing their buildings to their lenders because the offices in their big buildings are vacant and they can't fill them industrial can't be done from home. You cannot right. do warehousing at home. You can't do uh, manufacturing at home. There has to be a place to go where the equipment is bolted down to the floor. They don't move it to your house because you can be on Zoom. And so most of our buildings are uh, occupied by manufacturers who make various kinds of products. We have a company that makes protein bars. They were on Shark Tank, actually, on year one. Uh, what was the name of that one? It's called Element Bars, Jonathan Miller. Okay. So he's our tenant in 50,000 square feet. And That's awesome. I love Shark yeah, Tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got 80 people who work there. They, they You can't make protein bars unless you have the ovens and the mixers, right? Yeah. And the, people, and the packaging equipment. And then places to store the raw material before you make the product. And then the finished product to be shipped out in truck docks. Yep. We have another tenant who's uh, also in the food business. They make uh, fruit juice concentrate. It's called Tampico. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and they have uh, giant tanks and tubes and wires and $20 million worth of equipment where they put fruit something or other into the one side and it comes out as a goopy goop and they put hey, why it Why is in. it cloudy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why Tampico is cloudy. That's the only thing. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. it's, just... it's goop. <laughs> so they're, they're in the goop manufacturing business and they have to go there. They they're, they can't make the goop at home. There's a, They make tons and tons of this stuff, right? The concept yeah. in every flavor that goes into the drinks that they sell. So... And then we've got companies that make magnets and companies that make um, machines and just so many safety products. We've got a company that makes safety products. And each one of them is a company that does millions of dollars worth of sales. And they try to make a profit on their millions of dollars. So they have to be very efficient. And they need the best building possible to make their products the most um cost-effective way where they can make it and ship it out in a location where the trucks can get to it easily yeah. and where there's plenty of parking for all their employees in the parking lot. So industrial is doing great. Uh, Amazon and many other uh, companies that sell consumer products are all online most of the time. We have this one tenant called um, Instacart. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they deliver groceries. Yep. They have to have a place where they assemble all that stuff and send it out. And then we've got one where we have a package delivery facility for the U.S. Postal Service. Really? Potentially, possibly the worst tenant we've ever had. They uh, they are very disorganized and they don't pay the rent on time. Really? You're talking about the U.S. government. Get, yeah. <laughs> but they always owe us money. Yeah. Wait, by the way, government they're good, they're good for it. They're good for it, but they also have a hundred employees in this facility and the employees 
they smoke outside and they throw their butts on the ground and they eat hamburgers from McDonald's and they throw the wrapper on the ground. It's, it's wow. like, and that's wild because in the residential side, that section eight housing, like landlords go to that because the rent is on time and it is guaranteed to come in. So it's weird that it's so backwards on the industrial side for that. Yeah, most of our tenants pay rent perfectly consistently every month. Yeah. And we only have a couple that don't and they usually catch up. It's it's not like they're 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 not bad. They're just Yeah. they're they're disorganized or they're they're having a little problem for a short period of time. But when I go to an investor group and I put together a group of say 30 investors to buy a building, I have to tell them the good and the bad. I can't just sell it. I have to explain what's wrong. And the trust is built when you syndicate with investors, when you tell them the risks and the bad things that are likely to happen, because then they understand that, you know. Yeah. And is that something you learn through experience or because yeah. as an agent, when I started out on the residential side, that's like the fear. Like you don't want to tell them all the bad stuff because you're going to lose the sale. Yeah. Yeah. It's not selling when you get investors. It's really, it's disclosing. It's, yeah. it's how you disclose, you know, you got to do a little bit of selling because if you believe in the, the investment and the property, you can't help but be excited about it. Right. So that does come shining through. Hey, I love this building. It's a great size. It's a great location. We've got a fantastic tenant, but here's what could go wrong. And there's about a dozen things that you need to know that if you don't ask, I'll tell you what could go wrong. Yeah. That's yeah, transparency is key. I think transparency and like you said, disclosing, but you know, if, if you get to that point and you make them see the big picture, as opposed to just all the shiny, bright, good stuff, then it, they get, they get a better idea of what the true potential or risk is. So yeah, then there's no I wish questions. I could go back to that wealthy family and sit in their living room for the first time and make a first impression and say, first, let me tell you why you should not invest with me. That would be, have you talked to that investor since? Yeah, I did. I called him about a year ago. I said, I have a new deal. He says, I still have a bad taste in my mouth. Really? <laughs> yes. Plenty of fish out there. Plenty of fish. So, He's not the last fish. Right, right. Uh, and by the way, he's a good guy, but very tough. Yeah. So I heard before I even met with him, this guy's tough. And he was. He shut me down after my first comment. That is the definition of tough. That's, <laughs> yes. a, that's a tough battle there. He said to me, we can be friends, but we're not investing with you. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yet. We'll put yet at the end of that one. No, he didn't say yet. He, he <laughs> was, no, he was just upset that I told him I hadn't lost any money and started with cockiness. Cockiness doesn't work. Yeah. Cockiness yeah. can work, but eventually you piss off somebody when you're so cocky all the time and you never stop being cocky. It yeah. just it people people feel it it just isn't right. Yeah, you kind of have to dabble in that confident cocky line cuz things humil- go wrong with a lot of humility. To- yes. Yeah. Humility humility is worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> cuz it's Absolutely. honest. You know, it's honest yeah. to, be, to be vulnerable and admit that you've got some faults and you've made some mistakes. That people really relate to that. Yeah. Because yeah. if, if they're in that position to where they're now investing, they've made, they've paved their road and along that road, they have also had their hiccups. So they know what you're going through. So that guy might look from, I don't know how old he was looking at the 29 year old you thinking like, man, he's got so much to learn. Yeah. I was 39 at that point. Oh, okay. Because I had already done a bunch of deals. That's why I told him I never lost money. Oh, that's right. That's these, right. I've done all these deals. I've never lost money. You should count on me. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye, Joel. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. At least he kept you around for a friend. So that's good. We still we have got since, the We have since played there. golf with each other. I've yes. just got into golf. So I'm, I'm like, that's uh, my new favorite hobby. 
So I'm waiting for the snow to finally fade. Be careful. It becomes an addiction for a lot of I people. I know. It's yeah, already kind of it, close. Don't let it be an addiction. It's going to ruin your baseball swing. Yeah, I don't have a baseball swing anymore. Hmm. That was gone 10 years ago. No, 20 years ago. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Industrial real estate. Uh, one thing I was reading about you is you go B and C class. Yeah. What the new stuff is really big. Huge, huge, uh, big box warehouses, over 200,000 square feet. My investors uh, don't want that. That's for pension funds. Pension okay. funds, insurance companies, REITs, people who have unlimited funds buy those because for them, a $50 million deal might be a small deal. For me, a $50 million deal would be the most gigantic thing I've ever done. And okay. people who invest with me like the small deal, but they and they get a better return because- if you buy one of these Amazon buildings and you're their landlord, the returns five five and a half percent return. It's if it, that's the yield, and my investors like seven or eight, and okay. the small buildings are better for that. And the big buildings are great. I'm not against it. Some people should invest with all different kinds of uh, syndicators and uh, and and uh, sponsors and developers, but just for me. In our case, small deals, all cash, no mortgages, safe, safe, safe. Because I went through such a hard time in the down cycles in the past. I just want to be really secure and have staying power in the future. Yeah. So and that's what my question was with oh, that BC. Because on the residential side, they look at like communities as an A or a B or a C. Obviously, you can have like higher end buildings. I didn't know in the in the industrial side of things, how do you group an A, B? Was it the size of the building or the size of the deal in its entirety? It's the it's the it's how modern the building is relative to older generation okay. buildings. The A stuff has very tall ceilings, lots of truck docks, uh, lots of maneuvering room for trucks, a uh, special sprinkler system that's um, like a... a a very high density deluge system uh, called ESFR. We we have these buildings that are older and smaller and not quite as efficient, but Amazon doesn't lease little buildings. That yeah. are the, they, they lease the big A buildings. So the B and C are maybe built in the 1970s or 80s or 90s and the ceiling's a little lower and the truck docks may be fewer uh, and it doesn't have the same curb appeal it doesn't look the same but it's got a lot of utility companies need to be in them so right they, we, we keep them leased as best we can and we're, we're mostly leased because there are so few small buildings being built anymore the big ones are the ones that are the, the class a are being built now by developers no one's building the little ones so they're they're not so much a commodity as they are like a little diamond in the rough every time one yeah. comes available it's it's unusual yeah and but, obviously with the buildings being built uh years ago when you acquire them is there um i don't know a general cost to upgrade it to get it back up to yeah, I guess, yeah. standard code yeah, and you yeah we're always your... chasing roof work hvac upgrades um paving driveways dock equipment, overhead doors, lighting. Uh, I know people in lighting, if you need connections with that, I'm sure you do as well. But <laughs> I, that was a I former have, life of mine. I used to sell LED lighting, interior and exterior oh. with the, with the uh, what is it called? The application engineers laying out, you know, and then also yeah, being we, mindful we have, of We have a guy that uh, is in the, that business who's actually one of our investors. Okay. So cool. I'm, I'm, I'm locked and loaded with that. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> It's very competitive. I know that. So it is. It is. And and in our area, Commonwealth Edison uh, has a program where they do subsidies and and pay for some of the lighting, and they make it very attractive to redo the lights. It's really a yeah, good, for sure. good program. Yeah. Nice. I had two questions. Um, so, how do you qualify new investors? What would be like a minimum entry point for say you had you were you had a new project or a new opportunity to come up 
I guess, what do you look for in that? And then yeah, all of our investors are accredited. That means they're all some some form of millionaire. Okay. We we don't have any non accredited um in our deals, not not on purpose. Uh, we want people who can afford to lose the money just in case the deal goes bad. And we want sophisticated people. Uh, I I qualify them by talking to them like this on a Zoom call for usually half an hour to an hour. Okay. And I ask a lot of questions. I take a lot of notes. I want to get to know them. They want to get to know me. Yep. And at the end of a 45-minute or one-hour conversation, we know whether or not it's a good fit. Okay. We know pretty well. And then sometimes they want to check out our references. They want to talk to existing investors. I'm happy to have them do that. Uh, sometimes um, they want to get a list of all the deals that we've done, our track record. I'll send them that list. And it's got all the, the good deals and the bad deals. So it's very transparent and they like that. So we qualify each other. And if it's a fit, we go do it together. And usually someone who goes into one deal with me goes into five or seven deals over the next yeah. couple of years. Yeah. That, that, that's interesting that you say that, right? Cause like you said, that you're, you're basically interviewing each other or qualifying each other because I know with talking to other podcast guests and even some um, personal friends, like they're sometimes hesitant about syndication, just like you said, because if you don't know who you're working with and you have to like, get to know them and are they trustworthy and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't want anybody part... joining who's not a good fit. I'm not, right. I'm not trying to, I don't try to sell anybody into investing. Right. I just tell them the facts. I give them the downside. I give them the upside and then get to know um, them and yeah. understand who they are and where they're, and I want to know everything about them. I want to know, who their spouse is, if they're single, if they have kids, how old they are, what they do for a living, what they did for a living, if they're retired. Right. I want to know them. Right. Really important because that's what life's all about for me. It's about the relationships and connecting with people. Yeah. Without that, what good is it? I agree. I agree. The other yeah. question I had was who is like your most unique or abstract tenant that you have? <laughs> if you can, if you don't have to name name of the I, business. No, but... I've got I've got a really great one. I've got a a woman owned business. Okay, they make exhibits for children's museums. Okay, most creative things. If you ever go to a children's museum and they have all kinds of interactive um, exhibits where kids climb around or they play with water and sand or it's it's we have that in Milwaukee Discovery World and then Betty Brin Museum and yeah those are. Okay. Very that's cool. What, so that's what she makes for museums like those all over okay. the world. She's she's a a renowned designer and builder of those exhibits. It's a fantastic company. They make an impact on children all over the world, and I love them. And uh, it's cool. I love to bring people there to see her operation. It's so fun. That is cool. And how stuff. do you get into that line of work? It's super cool. But if, where there's a need, there's somebody to fill it, man. Yeah. I think like yeah. 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 One more. My one son more. does uh my son does crunch labs. It's this guy who used to work for NASA engineer. Now he makes kid toys and he's got a factory. I believe it's in Southern Illinois or Indiana. Yeah. Um, but every year he gives out a thing for like one lucky kid. It's like the golden ticket to come to his factory. And like, that's what I'm picturing her facility as. It's just a big industrial building with a bunch of cool interactive stuff going around. Yeah, it's a workshop. She's got paint and she's got materials, wood and metals and plastics and acrylics. It's it's very cool. Wow. All of our tenants are cool. We, industrial is great because every tenant's different and they're all interesting to see how people make a living and what they do and what their uh, passion is. It's really fun. Yeah. And yeah. obviously you had mentioned all the different states that you've been doing deals in. Every state works a little bit differently um, and commercial real estate with it being as wide open. I call it the Wild West. Do you have like states or areas where you are more pro investing in some areas where you're like, I, the trend is no. no, no, no. Every area 
that's big enough. It's got to be big enough. For industrial, the key is not the location. It's the size of the market. Because if you're doing residential leasing, you know if you have thousands of potential tenants that if a unit becomes vacant, you'll fill it. Mm -hmm. If you're in a very, very small town and you're remote and you have 20 units coming available in the next year, it could be worrisome if there are only potentially like 100 tenants because yeah. they could go anywhere. They don't have to go to your building. And so the size matters for industrial because we have 16,000 industrial buildings in Chicago. That's a big market. That's the biggest market in the country for industrial. And it's very important to have enough tenants and buyers that if a building becomes vacant, that you don't have to worry about it. When I had a, I had a building in De Pere, Wisconsin that my aunt owned, and there were 20 buildings in the entire industrial park. And she said, they had a liquor distributorship that they own there. And I said, I'm happy to sell the building for you, but I don't know how it's going to go. And I put it on the market and I went up there and I called on every every company of the 20 in, in the De Pere Industrial Park. There's two parks there now. There was just one then. And nobody was looking to move. So guess what? It sat vacant for two years. Yeah. And I said to my aunt, I hope that you can cover this because the carrying cost is the taxes, insurance, maintenance, and utilities. And that's going to okay. cost you somewhere around 100 grand a year. She said, well, fortunately, I can cover that. And then we eventually sold it to the next door neighbor who was the only person that wanted it. And he knew that nobody else wanted it. So he stole it from her. Wow. It was probably worth a million dollars if there were two buyers and the guy paid 700,000. Ooh. Bad. Yeah, the, the sales cycle for commercial or industrial is one of fear for, my, for me. I'm not in it. So it's a little bit of that unknown, the fear of yeah. the unknown. But yeah, the... Yeah the sales cycle is always a little stressful. It's a lot stressful. Those. Yes. Yeah. That, that's it. That it's exactly vacancy is our biggest risk and vacancy can last a long time in the wrong place with the wrong building. That's why we have to choose our buildings carefully. Good sub markets, good sizes, good specs. Yeah. Really and you've obviously developed a pretty good system of what to look for and, and where you're headed. For those I things. eliminate, when I look at buildings, I eliminate almost every one of them as I can't do it, can't do it, won't do it, can't do it. I'd say we, we probably end up buying one out of every 100 we look at because if it's not the right building, I don't want to be stuck with it. We own them long term. And every time it comes available, it's a problem if you buy a bad building. A bad building can't be made into a good building. Yeah. If it's got too low of a ceiling or not enough parking, you can't fix that. Yeah. Do you have any like plans for like future use or future, I guess, not marketing, but like if you have buildings that you would look to acquire, do you come up with ideas of how to use them differently rather than just for manufacturing? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the one, the fruit juice uh, concentrate, Tampico's, we bought uh, those buildings. There were three buildings and they have 1,200 feet on the Chicago River in a really nice neighborhood. And I think when their lease is up, some residential developer will buy it from us and put condos there. Okay. And okay. so that's it's called a change of use. And it's probably the best way to make money in industrial. If you buy something for $10 million and it's industrial zoned and you can get the zoning changed and get a developer, it could be worth $20 million. So- in a very short period of time. I have a friend who bought a building for $3 million in a terrible, terrible, scary, awful neighborhood where shootings took place. And he took the risk, $3 million, and he sold it 10 years later for $35 million. Wow. Nice. Yeah, he very, took a risk. Nice. He took a risk. He went right. into an area that nobody wanted to ever go in. And it the, the area turned. It just, it just changed. It just... All of a sudden, like the artists started showing up and the cool shops and the cool restaurants were edgy and they were in a, like people would say, oh, I don't want to go there to that restaurant. But then a bunch of restaurants and then a bunch of art, art, art galleries and then the caterers start moving in and the florists. <laughs> All of a sudden you've got like the coolest neighborhood in the city and it came from nowhere. 
Wow. So is it appropriate to label it hipster area or no? Yes. Okay. Guys, I am gonna go show a building. I have to go yeah, uh, okay. I have to go cool. show a building to a potential tenant. Okay. Uh, anything else that you want to cover? No, I was I was just about to wrap it up because I know we were coming up on the hour. Wanted to be respectful of your time and I know you gotta finish up your Friday. So yeah. no, I appreciate it. Um we're definitely gonna keep in touch. I mean, you're you're the closest. Well, I won't say closest guest we've had because I've had one in Wisconsin here, but um, with where you're at in your career, very successful. Like I, I want to learn more from you personally. So call um, me anytime. I'm available. My son always wants to take the train down to Chicago, so we'll we'll make our way down to Chicago and we'll come see you. Yeah, I'll take you on a tour of the uh, Goop building. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> and I'll give you some some bottled. Uh, fruit juices he's um, gonna be ecstatic when i tell him we're gonna go see goop goop yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so anyway call me anytime and we've got a website for reaching out it's uh brit properties.com b-r-i-t one t brit properties.com and i do a lot of mentoring for people who want to try doing something new that i might have experience with i'm happy to do that awesome. no that would be awesome i'm definitely going to pick your brain offline and maybe yeah, we please. can uh, have you have you on in six eight months, maybe a year, just to touch base again and redo this all over. Yeah, if you're interested to. in doing, it. okay, I would love to. That would be great. Sounds good. Maybe yeah, we'll meet um, at the marina and have lunch. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. That would be great. I can get you a free lunch. I know the owner. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> no, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the snow that I think you're getting. Yeah, right we now. we do have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Uh, we'll drop a link to your website in the show notes okay. so okay. people that are listening can go t check that out. Okay. Great, sure. guys. Hey, this has been really fun. I'm, I'm glad that Definitely. we did this. Yeah, Good it was a great time. In. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Right. Bye See bye. ya.